I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer your questions about the First World War. Andy Metzler writes, Hi, Indy and team! He did, it's exclamation points. My question is in regards to the soldiers serving in artillery units. I can imagine it was a privilege to serve in artillery units way behind the trenches rather than being a common infantry soldier that will eventually have to go over the top. What did a man have to do? What requirements did he have to fulfill to be assigned to an artillery unit? It was actually the opposite. Not so much to the common soldier, but to the top brass. Um, the mindset was still from the 19th century where honor and glory was one at the front lines and not in the safety at the back of the lines. It's crazy to think about my modern standards, but that's the way the military back then thought. It was even sometimes a punishment for failure to be sent to the artillery if you were an officer. Now you can trace that mindset back to pre-Napoleonic times where lesser or maimed officers were sent to serve in the artillery. World War I began to change that mindset though. Artillery was, you know, the big dog in modern warfare, and it became more and more the field for specially trained and educated personnel who were able to aim and operate the new long-range weapons. Special artillery schools taught mathematics and physics and how to calculate distances and the angle of guns. Soldiers and officers had to read maps and coordinates, and mistakes could mean the deaths of their own comrades. Still, they got paid less, way less, than field officers. But more people proportionally survived from the artillery units than the front lines. Yes, they did. But aside from the technical guys, artillery regimental soldiers did not need special training to carry ammunition or to load and clean the big guns. That was also often the position for men who were considered unfit for frontline service. Uh, Ahmed Mubashir writes, Hey Indy. Hey Ahmed. Uh, firstly, I would simply like to commend the performance of you and your staff. Hey you guys, your performance has been commended. Thank you. Ahmed commends your performance. Woo! Say thank you to Ahmed. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, oh, and he says, buck up. Buck up. All right. Respect from Pakistan. Well, respect back from Germany. Um, I guess I'll simply leave my question for out of the trenches right here. Okay, during World War I, how were the officers trained, viz. academically and physically? Did they get a bachelor's in military arts and science, uh, as they do now? How did the standards change throughout the war? Huh. Um, well, there were officer training corps and schools of war already established in pre-war times, of course, where potential officers were taught basic and advanced concepts of leadership and military warfare apart from their regular standard education. Not only did the war increase the need for officers drastically, since the size of the armies expanded quickly and drastically, and more and more officers were killed on the front lines, but the new concepts of modern war made a lot, and we can even almost say most, of old military theories and concepts obsolete and even suicidal. Um, the new techniques had to be taught really quickly to officers who may have never even set foot inside a trench before. Some training schools were set up relatively close to the front to implement new ideas and techniques really quickly without sending men all the way back to, say, Britain or the USA. The war also made it easier for men from the ranks to climb the military ladder and be promoted to officers, posts which they probably wouldn't be considered before, creating what you would call the wartime temporary officer. Non-coms who showed competence in leading their men successfully were often sent to advanced training camps where they were specialized in platoon leader training, for example, and were taught the techniques of trench raiding or sometimes served in the staff of higher command levels. The Great War, in the way that wars usually do, accelerated the progress for military personnel to rise through the ranks by distinction and necessity. Um, Germany had introduced the Not Abitur, which allowed students who could be potential candidates for the officer schools to finish school early. 
you know what, this is a really big topic. Um, there are loads of books on it. You should get a book on this, okay? But thank you for writing anyway. Uh, Guillaume Belanger, Guillaume Belanger, Belanger? Okay, Guillaume, hi Guillaume, uh, writes, did the colonial soldiers on the Western Front serve as meat shields or, they were or were they recognized as valuable soldiers? That's a question that's actually hard to answer. Um, it's even being actively debated among historians today, and the impetus for that came from researchers in Morocco and Algeria who accused the Allied powers of a racist policy, that colonial soldiers were sent to the most dangerous front lines to serve as, well, as you say, meat shields. What we can say now is, yes, there was some racism involved, as it was involved in most everything at the time, uh, which is also a reason why the colonial soldiers were in their own regiments. Um, but on the other hand, we have no statistical accounts that testify that the casualty numbers of colonial soldiers, and I'm talking about like Algerians and non-white colonial soldiers specifically here, uh, were in fact higher, that casualty numbers were in fact higher than European, white, French, or British soldiers. Most accounts of frontline soldiers value the bravery and the spirit of their colonial comrades, while at the same time, they often call them, you know, barbaric or uncivilized, but since a great many white soldiers were barbaric and uncivilized in this barbaric and uncivilized war, that's pretty cynical and maybe just a testament to the times. But colonial soldiers were indeed valuable and elite forces like the Indian Lancers and the Zouaves, Zouaves from North Africa or the Nepalese Gurkhas were all as valued as much as any professional soldiers in the Entente armies. Question we get a lot. Okay, hello question we get a lot. Uh, when is the next episode about guns with Otias airing? Okay, um, for those of you who don't know, Otias is a cool American guy with a channel about guns, and he helps us with special episodes about World War I rep weaponry. Um, we don't have a definite date yet, but we are in the process of finalizing the episodes about Austro-Hungarian weapons. Uh, Otias has some big plans of his own at the moment, and he's got his hands on something really, really unique. So, why don't you show it to them, Otias? Hey, Indy, uh, I guess what you guys really want to see oh, is this German Tegewehr 1918 anti-tank rifle. Uh, beautiful thing. We already have a preview up on our channel of May firing this, and in a couple weeks we'll have the episode ready. We're just doing some more research. Uh, also, there's some machine guns on the way, and these big guys really don't lend themselves well to our live interview process because you can't really get them all in the same place at the same time. We have to travel for them. So, uh, come check out our channel for these big boys, and then, of course, we'll be with the Great War doing the rifles and pistols as usual. All right, man, thanks. If you want to learn more about the rifles of the First World War, you should definitely check out Otai's channel, especially the recent episodes about the German Gewehr 88, which were eye-opening for us, to say the least. Oh, is that my call to action? Okay, don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.